You are served with a writ by Sir Arthur Hill for the act of criminal conversation with the plaintiff's wife. He means to cut you off financially. Custody of Samuel shall reside with yourself. If you shall admit the child imposed upon your husband is the child of Mr. Garrow. I would be broken because you had struck such a bargain. I will not sign what is not true. I believe I have something that belongs to you. Kick it. You may need it. Seems you have bought me for a shilling. But at what cost to your life? smeared by Fleet Street or parodied by Grub Street. They'll soon forget about it. You must hope. Sarah Hill has contracted diverse debts and all shops and merchants are forbidden from giving credit to her on her account. Issued by Sir Arthur as a public announcement. How civilised of the man not to bear a grudge. Gladly starve for the one thing that would nourish me. Your son does not belong to you. Nothing belongs to you. Therefore, you must avail yourself of the charity of a third party, which you do. Will you ever approve of me, Mr. Sudas? Duck eggs, samphire, and... Gourd. Gourd. It, it is a form of marrow. It should all make a very singular meal. You did not think to require some credit for me. I did forget. You did. How fares your credit? At the Old Bailey, I am bought in that place still. I am as necessary as tea. Yet we can prevail and continue in this. Of course. If we can survive the gourd.
I shall repel all corners. My name is James Hadfield, and there is a great deal more and worse to come. You will act for him and Mr. Garrow to defend. Madam, your husband tried to kill the king. It is not an easy thing to defend. He is at Newgate. You will need no introduction from me. I do not understand your hurry. I must take my leave of you. And my husband also. What mean you? I hope that you and Mr. Gower will serve him well. I have loved this man so very dearly, but he is only sometimes the man I used to know. And it is for that man that I engage you. Thank you. Mrs. Hatfield. I am not bound to defend an assassin merely because you pay me for it. Go to Newgate. You will not find a thwarted murderer, a, a martyr, perhaps. A martyr to what, Mrs. Hadfield? To his cause. And I beg that you save him from it. Highness, is this not the disease of the French Revolution transmitted to our shores? They execute their king, and we must confront would-be assassins of our own. The rights of man. A vindication of the rights of woman. Hardly surprising that a pamphlet revolution begets a loaded gun. Your Highness, this is why this case must serve as a means of asserting the absolute authority of the monarchy. And keep any Regency Bill at bay. And more, a salutary lesson to zealous Whigs, reformists, and anyone else who doubts the balance of our Constitution, which, in any case, should always weigh in favour of order. Yeah, yeah. Discharged from the army, I came to London and made a living as a silversmith. But weary of life, I bought a pistol from a Mr. Wakelin, borrowed a crown from Solomon Hugh, and bought some powder and cast some lead slugs. You say you were tired of life? I am as good a shot as any in England. I do not understand. I fired my pistol over the royal box. You wished merely to be caught. I wished for death. To raise an alarm and then be set upon by my fellow Englishmen, who would beat me to death in their indignation, tear me apart with patriotic passion. But that did not happen, Mr. Hatfield. 
Now I hope that my life shall be forfeited at the trial. I will still die, but not by my own hands, for suicide is a sin. You wish your existence destroyed? Mr. Darrow, you understand what I'm about. He cannot defend him. He does not want to defend. His wife did not identify his cause, but I identify it now. His cause is his own death. A plan hatched by his madness. Therefore, he needs a defense from such lunacy. The law on madness as a defense requires total derangement. Continuous distemper of the mind. Hatfield is not such a condition. But he seeks oblivion. But half the time speaks and utter reason. I cannot defend him. The law on madness does not allow me. Allow you? Since when have you concerned yourself with what you are allowed to do? True. Well, when I am required to defend the attempted assassination of the king, perhaps you'll allow me a little circumspection. Think of the attention the light from this trial will generate. Unless you no longer have a heart for it. Unless your heart beats only for the life domestic. You would not wish me happy, Mr. Sweethouse? Always. But most especially when you stand up at the Old Bailey to turn a jury, confront a liar, and make a bad law. But only when I'm briefed by you. Invariably. <laughs> I will enter a curiosity here. But there is yet more work to do. Then do not delay me. I would gladly prosecute anyone who threatened the life of the king. Of course, I do so as a patriot, not for any preferment that such a case might bring. In order to prosecute this trial, you will be made king's counsel. One of His Majesty's counsels, learned in law. KC. You shall now have that membership. You make this appointment, obviously, on the basis of merit. And a seat on the judge's bench will beckon, eventually. Especially if a trial such as this goes well. <laughs> For such an appointment, I would hang the man myself, Lord Melville. My own court. And in my court, a trial in which Garrow is appearing. I would sustain every objection made against him. I would direct a jury not to find for him. My God, I'd make his life hell. Impartially and in full accordance to the strictures of the law. This is a political trial. Mr. Sylvester, you will not simply denounce the man in the dock. You must let the people realize how close this country came to calamity. My neighbour tried to kill the King of England. Do you think that spies would not be sent here? He is sometimes like a man not for me to be with. He runs on talking a whole heap of stuff. Stuff? As if his brain is unsettled, as if he's flurried in the head. Be more specific. He would fly from one argument to another. Talk of his relationship with God. I am sure we all examine our relationship with God. And do we all insist that we must die for him? I know he wishes to die, but do you know why he wishes to be God's martyr in particular? You look for reasons from such a man? No, I look for unreason. I look to see what depths it may plumb. And you would reacquaint yourself with his wife, but she is fled and will never come alongside him again. Yet she pays me to save him, for the man he was. Albert may never forgive him for the man he was that night. Redknapp witnessed Hadfield in a terrible rage, his wife screaming and fleeing in terror with their child, and still fleeing, obviously. But if we cannot find her, we have him still to unravel. He speaks wildly to his neighbour. He makes his wife fearful. He wishes his own death. You think there may not be a method in his madness? Then find it, and he is exposed. 
and you are spared his defense. Do you know the whereabouts of your wife, sir? I think I lost me. And your son, also? He is not yet two years old and may never recall me. If your wife knows of the trial, we must hope that she will come forward as a witness for you. Or I could ask Mr. Suithouse to venture to any address. She has frustrated God's work. By which you mean? She did prevent me from acting in obedience to the superior commands of heaven. That she is not so devout a believer? He did not call upon her. By which you mean, sir? I knew I was to be a martyr and persecuted like my great master, Jesus Christ. I shall have my trial as Jesus did before he was crucified. This commission, coming from where, Mr. Hadfield? I am in constant contact with the author of all things. He has warned me that at the beginning of the 19th century, the world will perish unless I sacrifice myself for his salvation. I see. I see. If you are to play this part, sir, do you not think it requires something more in the way of an antic disposition, some more acting out? Suicide being a crime and a sin. I went to the theater and shot towards the king in the hope that by the appearance of my crime, my life would otherwise be taken from me, as it is death I wish for, death I seek. For nothing but death will satisfy God, who calls me to his presence, where I shall witness his second coming as his true descendant and loyal son. Your words run together like a fervent prayer, sir. But I see no drool. No raving frenzy that will convince me. You mock me, sir. This is all counterfeit. It is a solemn promise to God. You think to kill the king from some vile opinion and then feign that your mind is not your own. But, Mr. Hatfield, a plea of insanity would require something more in the way of constancy of that condition. Do you understand? You are not a madman, sir, but a failed assassin who has the wits to try defense. Then would I not wish it success? I do not, because I must be found guilty, Mr. Garrow. I must be. Well, then plead so, sir. Plead so. You have no need of me. You have no need of a jury. Let the judge dispatch you. I loyally serve my country in the 15th Light Dragoons, and I will never plead guilty to treason. It was not my aim to kill the king, and I will not be known in history as such a man. But you still wish a jury to find you guilty, and so dispatch you. I'm sorry if I confound you.
three months we have been in Europe, was my absence not meant to quieten this ridicule? How do they draw you? Show me. Variously. Here, with my ass set on both sides of the channel. And how do they write about me? As someone who is worshipped at the shrine of Venus, as a lover of variety. <laughs> Not much variety to be had here in Baramba. But I think you know they mean the bow you've <laughs> recruited to your cause. And you know, I mean, that we're a very long way from any theatre. And from the tables at Brooks. Well, in Promenade and Brighton. I cannot be in London. I cannot stoke their contemptuous attention. This may be your constituency, but must it also be your exile? Well, it does seem so. Arthur. I cannot, for my disgrace, and find ways to content myself despite you. But you must either face down your reputation or rehabilitate it. As if not, you will never come to anyone's attention. You are a very rare mistress. The bird of paradise cannot survive in Sussex. Mmm. Mmm. Sound of a cuckoo? Sir Arthur is in Bramble. Yes, you enlightenment. This way, gentlemen. A place where muddled minds may find refuge and understanding. And so might we. The incurables, gentlemen. Sorry spectacle, I'm sure you'll agree. And our inmates held communally. Ladies' ward and men's ward. Where I reside. Mr. Crichton's office just here, gentlemen. Thank you, Vincent. Vincent, resident of the men's ward, apparently. Vincent is enjoying a sunnier day than as usual. He can, in his darker moods, foam like Niagara and has to be restrained with a jacket for the purpose to prevent the ebullitions of his anger. His anger must indeed be fierce. What occasions it? He thinks himself cheated of his fortune by a lawyer. We shall not broach that subject on the way out. James Hatfield is to be prosecuted for the attempted assassination of the King. Now, previous defences of insanity are based on the idea of men having a total deprivation of reason, memory and understanding. The law requires it. Thank you. In other words, the accused has to be demonstrably mad. The mind stormed in its citadel, quite defeated by frenzy. Reason not merely disturbed, but wholly driven from her seat. We do not defend such a man. And I have rarely experienced such a madness in men. So madness, as defined in the law, is simply wrong. I am but mad north, north, west. But when the wind is southerly, I can tell a hawk from a handsaw. Hamlet telling Rosencrantz and Guildenstern that although he may act the part of a lunatic, he still has his wits about him. And oftentimes the genuinely mad do also have their wits. Vincent, for instance. Yes. He is not today in the grip of his delusion. Delusion? A false impression. Which sits alongside other views that are not false at all. Which are quite correct. And so ability is not proof of sanity. No. Delusions exist at the utmost state of ability. So a man may show proper sentiment in one instance and on another subject... The subject of his lunacy... Complete irrationality. 
I think we make progress. Our defence, not merely madness, but setting about the understanding of madness. Better described as a malady. Exactly. It will put us in dangerous territory. What mean you? Have you not heard the King described as afflicted in that way? Then we are in very good company. This cannot be. You think it's so unnatural? I think it is beyond sense. Success is unlikely, the cost astronomical, and you do not possess the means. I have acquired the means, so issue the writ. How did you acquire them? In a way that is right. In a way that is legal? I will have my son. Does William know you intend this? Issue the writ, Mr. Sudas. You think to save me? I think to save you from your madness. Madness? I behold a glorious calling, Mr. Garrow. A life everlasting in the brilliance of God's countenance. In the countenance of your wife. You do not linger ever on that. The love that she has shown for you. I so do wish to see her. You do. In order that I may say goodbye. Before you embrace the greater glory of your sacrifice. I cannot ignore it. And I must do my duty and save you from yourself. There he is! Madness lies abroad when our good king can be shot at in a public theatre. Yeah. What atrocities lie in wait for us when the royal box of the Drury Lane Theatre is assailed by gunshot that has our monarch falling to his knees to escape his death. Oh. <laughs> and although we may give thanks that the king may live and thrive still, society demands that this assassin be exposed in all his darkness. If a man is completely deranged, so that he does not know what he does, nor its consequences, has lost all sense, is incapable of distinguishing between good and evil, then the mercy of our law says that he cannot be guilty of a crime. Even one so monstrous as the attempted murder of the King of England. But I do not defend such a man. He's not completely deranged. He didn't know what he tried to do, and he has not lost all sense. According to our law, my client is guilty because he is not mad enough. He's not demonstrably mad. He's not mad at all times. He's not mad now. But it will be my defence, gentlemen, my argument, to show that madness is not some wild land to which those afflicted are forever banished, but that it is a bewildering place to visit and to return from, sometimes in a matter of hours. Buller, call on adjournment. 
Mr. Sylvester, you will call your first witness. My lord, there is some new development that requires... Adjournment? If I may beg your indulgence. If Hadfield is found to be mad, then the nature of his lunacy may be said to be shared by others of a <clears throat> nervous disposition that does afflict them. You talk of the king. How fares he, your highness? He has been out of sorts. We allowed him to walk in the grounds at Kew Gardens, but he did spy Fanny Burney there and... And then, your highness? He spoke to her of all manner of things. All manner of things? His physician calls it a derangement of his faculties, that he suffers from a bilious fever. But at other times, he has a very sound perception. Imagine this. A monarch removed not by the guillotine, but by the comings and goings of his mind. Then I must refute utterly the condition of Mr. Hatfield's mind. He must be shown to be as sane as any one of us. And I must find out who Mr. Garrow calls for the defence. To what purpose? I saw the prisoner raise a horse pistol in the auditorium and then take aim at the king. And before the first shot was fired, Your Highness? As the shot was fired, a stagehand raised the arm of the assassin so as to direct the contents of the pistol into the roof of the royal box. Then, Your Royal Highness, he did not aim to miss. The king was saved by a stagehand and a patriot. And then, Your Highness? The orchestra played God Save the King. <laughs> Mr. Gallo. In the whole of the conversation which Your Highness had with this man, did he betray in his answers any irregularity in which you could collect a then existing derangement of his understanding? Not the least. No more questions, my lord. Your Highness. How fares the King after his ordeal? Quite recovered. I understand that he has been cupped, purged and blistered of late. I trust that has quickened his recovery. Thank you. Yes, that is so. Mr Garrow, you will address yourself to the facts of the night in question. My Lord, of course. Will Your Highness have the goodness to recollect whether there was anything more said by Mr Hadfield? He said something like, the worst had not happened yet, or more is to come. So the act about which he was most deliberate was the destruction of his own life. A happy consequence of assassinating the king, perhaps? <laughs> not seem like a very collected state of mind, would you agree? You will address the witness as Your Royal Highness, Mr. Garrow. Will it please Your Royal Highness to address the questions? The enormity of the crime he had embarked on had, perhaps, shaken him. Had he previously encountered the prisoner? His face seemed familiar. He reminded me he'd been one of my orderlies at the Battle of Fremont. You recollect him loyal, Your Royal Highness? A good soldier. A good soldier. A good soldier. In battle against the French, in service of the king. And now, with some rational motive to kill him, I think not. Are assassins ever rational? If their design is to kill someone. It may be alarming, but it has reason. Such as when the king believes the nation about to be inundated in a great flood. His warning alarming, but his reason surely to strengthen our flood defences. You will not make comparison between the king and the man who tried to destroy him. Mr. Garrow, I do hope you have no further questions.
Mr. Sylvester, you may call your next witness. My lord, I call Mr. John Redknapp. I swear by Almighty God to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Can you say something of the mood and bearing of your neighbour on the day in question, Mr Redknapp? He was as well as I have ever seen him. And, um, how did he go about his business? Nothing but as usual. Conversation disjointed in any way? He spoke of going to attend a performance at the Drury Lane Theatre. <laughs> and your acquaintance with him previously, any evidence of lunacy? Never. Liar! Perjurer! Oh. Shoot out! One more outburst like that will have you removed. <laughs> Mr Hartfield procures a firearm. Mr Hartfield positions himself at the Drury Lane Theatre in order to get the best possible shot at the King. In short, Mr Hartfield exhibits a steady and resolute design requiring planning, precision and pinpoint timing. <laughs> Is this a madman in a frenzy? Is this a man so deprived of understanding that he knows no more of what he is doing than a brute or a wild beast? He purchased powder and shot. Do wild beasts negotiate commercial transactions? <laughs> I am a little confused, Mr. Redknapp. You were to appear here as witness for the defence. I wish to retract the statement I had previously made. That is quite evident. And your previous statement, not merely retracted, rather turned on its head. I had been mistaken. And I too, then. My attorney took you as an honest man. Mr. Gallo, let the court condemn or commend. Mr. Redner. Mr. Redner. Have you ever seen the prisoner exhibit any kind of disturbance? Only when his blood has been inflamed through drink. You've seen him drunk on many occasions? He likes his liquor, sir. You do realise that Mr Hatfield has in recent years been temperate, as required by his religious convictions. You are aware of the prisoner's religious convictions? No, sir, no. He's not drunk beer or liquor in five years. So perhaps you may help me wonder what else might cause this inflammation of the blood that you speak of? I cannot venture. I do not know. We adjourn. My lord. For refreshment. The corpse shall rise. Must hope that Mr. Crichton can convince that an all or nothing definition of madness is a nonsense. Or else. Or else if I could demonstrate the nature of Hatfield's mind to the jury. Alas, it is his wife who knows best the mind of her husband. Yes, but she is gone. I will speak to Redknapp again. You thought him in difficulty about him? Some may call it that. here or I will see you taken to the magistrates for perjury and make it known to your neighbours of Southwark that you are a government spy and in their pay. You think they will allow such a man to live peaceably here? You mean to have me killed? I mean to have Hatfield saved. Were you not threatened by Lord Melville? Yes, but I am a worthy man despite my testimony. Worthy? Worthy of what, Mr Redknapp? A woman flees her husband's madness, carrying her child. She would look for safety, sanctuary, soonest and nearest. You have seen his humours. And as you say, you are not without virtue, and so you open your door to her. Such a woman should not suffer so. 
Such a woman. No. I begged her to stay with me. Alas, I could not persuade her. Where did she go to? I hoped her refusal to stay on with me merely a practical matter. Where to, Mr. Redknapp? But I saw her return to him again. Where? When? At the Bailey. She is in there? In the gallery. She loves him still. You lied in court that he may be killed and his widow turned to you. Such a man should not live. We command you that you bring before us in the Court of Chancery the body of Samuel Hill, who is detained in your custody. So not only does she break into my house to steal my property, she thinks to have Samuel return to her. You think it not part of some bargain she has to negotiate with you? I mean, if it were me, I would be seeking considerably more pin money. She funds her action with stolen jewellery. I wonder she could not attach herself to a wealthy benefactor. Well, she's not you, Henrietta. She has Mr. Garrow for company. Well, then they collude here. You think it's her? Why else would an adulterous woman presume to take a child away from its father with Garrow to encourage her? Crim con trial turned out to be the most pyrrhic victory. But I shall confound them here far more unequivocally. It may also restore your reputation. Because she would not only be challenging your authority, but the authority of all men who are fathers. And you would quickly gain the sympathy of all men. You offer this remedy because of your great feeling for me. I offer this remedy because it must take us back to London. Soonest. Would you please name the usual symptoms of lunacy? Uncommon fury, jealousy or suspicion without cause or grounds. Simply symptoms of a vicious character, then. Mr. Sylvester, wait your turn. Mr. Crichton, you have carried out an examination of the prisoner. Please afford the court an opinion, or rather an insight, based on your considerable experience. The condition of Mr. Hadfield does not manifest itself constantly. See. And so there is no total deprivation of memory and reason. Correct. And how or when does his condition manifest itself? If any question concerning common matters is put to him, he answers very correctly. But if any question is put to him which refers to the subject of his lunacy, he answers irrationally. Delusions are very powerful forces. They cannot be shaken by perception or sense. Delusion sets in like a disease. It infects just as much. And can the delusion appear in the utmost state of ability? The ability to purchase pistol and shot and take one's place to the theatre? Yes. Even when the delusion which propels the action has no foundation or existence. This argument is somewhat new. That madness is, if not also occasional, then somehow the false reality of a diseased mind. My lord, I contend that the, the total deprivation of understanding and memory is a legal fiction. <coughs> Mr. Crime, if. <coughs> As you suggest, madness is not a total state. Uh, do you mean by that, then, that the insane suffer periods when they are not themselves? Yes, I agree with that. Good. Then, during other times, if I'm to understand you, they show a, a partial degree of reason. Yes. Then can we not say that 
the prisoner was in his true state when he committed the crime. Not if we accept the real motivation for the action, the satisfactions and fulfilment of the delusion that brought Mr Hadfield before the king. Ah, oh, is it every frantic and idle humour of a man to be exempted from justice and the law? Are there not many circumstances that can displace a good self? Greed, envy, malice, the coveting of another man's horse. <laughs> You could not take your leave of him after all. I am loyal still, but I feel I must hide in plain sight. You can be more loyal yet. If you will give some narrative, some understanding to the jury about the nature of your husband's madness, then we may have a compelling defence. I do not wish his death. Your attendance here speaks of your heart. Oh, you think that's so? I am as afraid of the pardon that may be granted him if you succeed. And you say so because of the events of that night? I would not be able to bear to recollect them in court. In any case, they may condemn him. Or save him, madam. But I fear I will provoke him. Provoke what does afflict him. You must allow me that provocation. My lord, I call Mrs. Anne Hatfield. by Almighty God to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Mrs. Hatfield, could you please give a description of your husband's true self? <clears throat> Most times he was good and kind. And other times? He would confound me, buy a new jacket, and then immediately part with it for an old and tattered one, or lie awake at night singing psalms and hymns or simply walk about in the middle of the night unable to sleep. I had still only then thought his behaviour odd or queer or flighty. Until such time as when, Mrs Hadfield? Something that you could not so easily give a name to? I could give a name to it, but it is hardly to be thought about. Of course. If you would try to recall, for your husband's sake. I will not send him to the gallows here. You will not. You must simply speak the truth. Then... The night before he took the pistol to the theatre, I knew what he had a mind to do and begged him to think of our son, of the duty he had to him. I was holding our infant in my arms, and suddenly, my husband dragged the child from my arms. Please try to continue. I saw him. I saw his purpose. Mr. Hadfield. His purpose? His purpose to thwart you. Sent to confuse and detain me. Child. Child held by his mother. A snake. Writhing in the bosom of the devil. <laughs> Mr. Gallon, who do you examine here? You had to be worthy of Christ, did you not? I could not delay to purify myself with death. You could not allow the child to delay you. The old ways of life must come to an end. Before Christ can come and bring about our resurrection and my renewal... You sought to repel this awful creature who would prevent that. I took the one that did pretend to be my son from the one that did pretend to be his mother and tried to dash his brains against the wall. Until... until I hadn't rescued him from me. And through my tears, gave up my assault upon him. Upon? Upon this snake, the 
is tempted. Who is also my beloved child. The moment that he tried to kill his son, could have had a rational conversation about any circumstance of his past life and anything connected with his present, except only the quality of the act that he was meditating. James Hatfield knew perfectly well that he was the husband of this woman and the father of this child. And yet still he was enthralled to the overruling dominion of a morbid imagination. Did the prisoner not cry because he knew the evil he was doing and the consequences of it? My lord, he cried because he could not stop what he was doing. He could not stop his sickly purpose. Mr. Sylvester, uh, do you have any questions for the witness? No, my lord. I merely wish to address the jury before you ask them to return a verdict. As you wish. We are told this is a man who, as manifestation of his lunacy, wished nothing more than to bring about his own death. If this be so, I have one very simple question. Why did he not plead guilty? Why avail himself of a defence? If he wishes to ensure his own destruction, why seek out the wiles and stratagems of Mr. Garrow to avert such a fate? No, I would avert it. I would have the defence for the sake of my husband, for the man he once was. The man you can still sometimes be. Mr. Garrow. Where James Hadfield bears the appearance of purpose and planning, he retained no capacity to appreciate the legal consequences of his behavior. And by the law's notion of intent, James Hadfield had not chosen to kill the king. I hope that your sound understandings, gentlemen, will easily enable you to distinguish infirmities which are misfortunes from motives which are crimes. <clears throat> well, gentlemen, depravity or disease, the true self displaced or an act of willful deliberation and wicked purpose. Mr. Garrow argues here for a change in the law on madness. No small debate. Will you allow it? The decision you reach here today may... No. Will. Have profound consequences. Deliberate and we will have your verdict. You've reached a verdict. We have. Have you find? Not guilty. <laughs> Prisoner, for his own sake and for the sake of society at large, must not be discharged. I suggest he be properly disposed of, all mercy and humanity being shown this unfortunate creature. Congratulations, you've made a successful defence. And the reward for your client is indefinite incarceration. You must know that it may be possible for patients to recover if simply confined in peaceful surroundings. So I commend you to the care of Mr. Crichton. I hope that one day I will be grateful to you, Mr. Garrow. And I wish you peace, James. Some resolution here, at least, Mr. Suitors. And are you resolved and settled in your own house? What mean you? About the service I have performed for Lady Sarah in the way of Samuel. I am in Parliament tomorrow to announce a new treason bill. 
You propose to make such trials less likely to fail. I propose to make it clear that we seek to circumscribe the rights of all those who will announce their disenfranchisement. Madmen, slaves, Irish, Catholics, women, gentlemen. We must press them down in their delirium. A writ of habeas corpus against you. It will require him to produce Samuel in court and show cause why he should detain him. And you think he'll do what? Simply submit to you? My Lord Melville. Hill. We may travel together, I think. Can that still be so? If you can hear me. I'm called to a custody hearing. My absolute right as a father is to be questioned. Challenged. My God, the sickness of the age is truly upon us. I will not let it overcome me. And my defence is a remedy. You seek not merely custody from this. If the trial bring my rehabilitation as a man, it must also bring it as a politician. And Gara, you mean? Of course. She lives as his dependent since the trial. Avenge it. <laughs> Who to represent you? Not you. In the course of custody, your very presence could be used as evidence that Samuel would live with his mother and her lover. You've given it some thought. Have you paid as much attention to the bill that will be presented to you? I went to the house. I took the jewels I used to wear and... In a... Under the law, they do not belong to you! He has stolen my son! I cannot represent you at court of King's Bench. I may, of course, to represent you at the Bailey, as you stand in the dark. I warn you, Hill will come for his retribution. breaking looms and cutting silk. He has issued me with a writ. All I ever had is his in-law. Am I still to call you uncle, then? You are my brother's son. What else should you call me? Samuel's absence is a wound. Give him back to me. We shall see him the law prefers. These two are lost. You think so? Oh, I'm sure of it. Mitchell is in the chair for Have I Got a Bit More News for You in 25 Minutes here on BBC One. That's after the news. Next.